This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including DeGrasier Daniels, Irwin Sturr, and Ken Hayes. Coming up on DTNS, Section 230 hangs in the balance of sorts. Do we need AR laptops? And Dr. Nikki Ackermans has the latest on smell o vision This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 18th, 2023. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich s t r a f a l i n o I'm from Sweet Home, Alabama. I'm Dr. Nikki Ackermans. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Good stuff. We're all here in various parts of the world. Nobody's having any tornadoes, so to speak. <laughs> you know? Not Let's see how we, how we fare by the end of the show. But first, Let's start with some quick hits. Montana Governor Greg Giaforte signed a law making it illegal to distribute TikTok in app stores within the state. The bill bans downloads of the app but doesn't touch on app updates or web access. App store operators face a fine of $10,000 per violation per day, though citizens won't face fines under that law, which goes into effect on January 1st, 2024. And even after that, people in Montana can continue to use TikTok. If they already have it on their devices, TikTok says it will fight the ruling, but didn't announce definite plans for a lawsuit. Internet Trade Association NetChoice, which is fighting laws regulating speech in Texas and also Florida, called the Montana law unconstitutional. Governor Giaforte also directed the,、uh, the state's chief information officer to ban Telegram, WeChat, The shopping app Timu and ByteDance owned CapCut on government devices as well. At its YouTube brandcast event, a can't miss event, YouTube announced it will start running 30 second unskippable ads before top performing content when watching it on a connected TV. These ads, will be available,、uh, these ads will be available in YouTube Select, which targets the top 5% of content on the platform. So this will be ads for top performing content. There's a reason for the new ad format because it turns out 70% of YouTube Select impressions come from TV. So、uh, the top content is getting watched on TVs and they want to put unskippable ads in front of it. YouTube will also start testing ads that show up when you pause video. NVIDIA launched its mid range GPUs based on the Ada Lovelace architecture. The good news no price increase over the previous generation. The less good news is that the cards only offer mild performance increases. The RTX 4060 Ti starts at $299 for 8 gigs of RAM coming on May 24th. The 16 gig 4060 Ti costs $499. The $299 4060 will go on sale in July. Well, we know how the cookie will crumble, or at least the third party variety. Google announced some plans to roll out its privacy sandbox, its replacement for third party cookies. This is designed to group users into cohorts based on browsing patterns while letting users manage their interests and is designed to provide、uh, greater privacy and anonymity.、Uh, in early 2024, Google will migrate 1% of Chrome users to Privacy Sandbox and disable third party cookies. Google says this will provide real world data to assist developers in getting ready for the change, which is still planned for the second half of 2024. The company consulted with the UK's Competition and Markets Authority on the rollout plan to you know, get ahead of regulatory win, headwinds on the、uh, rollout. A lot of people saying 1%, that's nothing. When you're Google, that's、mm-hmm. something. OpenAI published a chat GPT app on the iOS App Store in the US, offering almost the same functionality as the web version, but supporting speech input using OpenAI's Whisper Speech Recognition System. The app will roll out to other markets in the coming weeks. But don't worry, OpenAI ended their blog post announcing it with PS. Android users, you're next. Chat GPT will come into your devices soon. Ominous. Phew. No, we're, we're good. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's talk politics.、Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its rulings in two cases that affect Section 230. That's the safe harbor law in the U.S. We've talked about this on DTNS quite a bit in the past, but Rich, 
Let's talk about the first situation that has unfolded. Yeah, so let's break down Twitter versus Tomna. The court dismissed the allegations that Twitter violated the U.S. Anti-Terrorism Act by failing to remove posts before a deadly attack. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote the opinion for the unanimous decision, so everybody's on board, saying that Twitter's failure to police content was not a, quote, affirmative act. He made comparisons between Twitter and things like email and cell phone service, pointing out that phone carriers are not liable for illegal drug deals made over their phones, just using the infrastructure. Specifically regarding Twitter, he wrote, there are no allegations that defendants treated ISIS any differently from anyone else. Rather, defendants' relationship with ISIS and its supporters appears to have been the same as their relationship with their billion plus other users. Arm's length, passive and largely indifferent so basically twitter is not preferencing that content in any way just treating it the way it would any other he even touched on the main issue from the other case algorithmic recommendations he wrote quote the algorithms appear agnostic as to the nature of the content matching any content including isis's content with any user who is more likely to view that content the fact that these algorithms match some ISIS content with some users thus does not convert defendants' passive assistance into active abetting. So again, this kind of distinction uh, you know, between, between active uh, as assistance, we saw affirmative act uh, earlier, and then kind of passive business as usual actions here. So as we said back in February, after the oral arguments, the decision on Twitter would have an effect on Google. So Sarah, can you break down how that went? I can. Okay. So in Gonzalez versus Google, the plaintiff alleged that YouTube was on the hook for terrorist content because its recommendation algorithm constituted editorial selection and therefore should be considered direct speech and not covered by Section 230 protections. In an unsigned opinion, the court wrote that the, quote, Liability claims are materially identical to those at issue in Twitter. Also saying, since we hold that the complaint in that case fails to state a claim for aiding and abetting, it appears to follow that the complaint here likewise fails to state such a claim. And we therefore decline to address the application of Section 230. So the claims in Gonzalez were also dismissed. What stood out for me looking in some of the either back from the oral arguments or now looking and, and looking at those from the lens of this ruling is, is kind of a, 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 a seems like a universal agreement among the justices or a lot of the justices kind of across the ideological spectrum in that they really think Cong this is something Congress needs to take care of. But at the same time, that this law is kind of exceeding whatever like this this law is providing more coverage than it was originally intended back uh you know in 1996 uh uh when the when uh, uh, the uh, telecommunications telecommunications what decency act was was first passed so mm -hmm. th this interesting uh act but you know we, we we saw uh statements from uh back back in february justice kagan and justice kavanaugh basically saying like this really needs to go to congress uh for you know to, to actually like clarify where we think the line for liability should be in a lot of these cases. Nikki, I don't know how much you've been following the stuff, but uh, what what is your take on where we are today? I mean, I've been following it very lightly on the surface, so my take may not be super insightful, just that like it's complex and and uh, it'll be interesting if it does go to Congress because we saw what happened with TikTok that nobody really knows what they're talking about. So it's a little bit worrisome in that aspect. But I, I tend to agree that like the platform can't control every single thing that people are saying on there. Uh, and so. Right. And, and that's what every platform will tell you. Right. It is like we can't we can't possibly do this. I thought um, uh, Justice Thomas's uh, notes that. Uh, you know, putting Twitter in a different category from something like email or cell phone service where, I mean, who are you going to sue? Who are you yeah. going to be made liable for this sort of thing can be very convoluted. Um, that said, uh, you know, it, the platforms have been, have been pushed towards doing more of this for some time now. Yeah, this, this doesn't uh, uh, undermine 230, but it really just sidesteps the issue and, and really points the, the, 
finger the at the fact Congress that like we don't know what to do yeah well it, it's interesting in in the in the first case the the twitter versus tomna case in that they basically say like using the infrastructure of these platforms does not constitute active abetting right so like it sets a yeah. very high bar for being like you have to sh if you're going to sue especially under the us anti terrorism act you're going to have to show that there was some sort of uh, beyond just alg you know beyond just uh, 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 recommending content or using their services to say that it, it's not enough for a failure of moderation, right? For this, for this content to be available. It's more that it has, you know, there, there has to be something beyond that, something more active. Uh, I think justice Thomas was very clear on that. All right. Well, one of the big stories that uh, we've been covering over the past couple of years really are the big promises of augmented reality. Uh, many uh, headsets released and uh, uh, speculated have promised all sorts of things. One of the big ones, though, the ability to eliminate fixed screens, kind of using AR for your screens. We've seen AR and mixed reality headsets from Microsoft, Meta, Magic Leap, and companies that don't start with M that offer this kind of functionality. <laughs> The startup Sightful is taking this to a little bit of another level with their new space top device described as an augmented reality laptop. They're claiming the first. I don't think anyone's disputing them on that one. Basically, it's a laptop, no screen. Instead, it has a hardwired set of customized and real glasses that the company claims offer a 100 inch equivalent screen. Inside the laptop, it offers 2020 Android flagship specs. The SoC is a couple years old, and it's running a custom space top OS. Didn't find a lot of details about if that's Android or something else underneath here. Uh, you know, Nikki, the idea of, uh, hey, let me throw on some glasses. I have my own private 100-inch screen. Does that seem more appealing than, I don't know, a 13 or 15-inch laptop? You know, I feel like we might run into the Google Glass problem where it's just like people don't like wearing stuff on them. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I might be wrong, but like, I don't necessarily want to wear glasses for my office all day. I feel like that'll give me a headache. <laughs> like when I'm going to watch 3D at the movie theater, uh, I could be totally wrong. And this might be way better than a screen, but it feels gimmicky right now. And I'd be interested to see where it's going. You know, so, Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I love VR, AR. I want it to succeed. I think I, because, I want it to be good. Right. That's, that's, yeah, what I, 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 there are certain use cases that I think work really well as far as, uh, I don't know, replacing my laptop, Ooh, hard sell. But, yeah. you know, if I'm thinking of, okay, my, my screen is, you know, what I'm wearing on my head, let's just say that I'm fine with that. You know, I'm going to have to have a keyboard of some kind or some extremely good uh, within the uh, VR experience uh, keyboard. Um, can I work? Can I use less space in my house? You know, is this something that can be put away more easily? You know, laptops are, you know, we're all used to that. So it's like, I mean, a laptop isn't taking up a lot of space. You know, if you're using some sort of a situation where I'm using now, I'm like, I got a big desk, yeah. I have all sorts of things. So that would be different. But something that, and also, I mean, call me crazy. But uh, when I, you know, crane down on my laptop all day, every day, Sometimes I feel pretty crappy at the end of the day, physically, you know, mm -hmm. my neck hurts, that sort of thing. Could this be an ergonomic solution uh, for some people? A good way to sell it. Well, and an ergonomic and a privacy setting too, because I could imagine, Ooh. you know, like they, you know, there are screen protectors to this day that'll limit your your field of view to like basically right in front of you. So if you're, uh -huh. you know, you're working on sensitive stuff in public or, oh, just, you, yeah. know, on a you know, plane you throw on these glasses, or, yeah. nobody mm -hmm. can see you. Uh, that being said, one of the things that I've, I've always loved this, this idea is going back to like the hollow lens, like, oh man, we just throw screens everywhere. And you know, you don't, you can be totally untethered, but the key is the field of view and uh, the Virgin's Monica Chin notes, she had some hands-on time with this, that the field of view, you can't see the whole 100 inch screen at any one point when you're like at a regular working distance from the laptop. Mm -hmm. So then you're like, she, she had instances where she couldn't find the, the mouse pointer, you know, cause it was at a part of the screen that she couldn't see and stuff like mm -hmm. that. The other aspect of it is there's it's 1080p resolution, which is good, but 
that's the max you're ever going to get. So if you're looking at the whole 100 inch screen, it's a 100 inch 1080p screen. That's where a lot of these fall down. We saw this with the, the MetaQuest Pro and some of that stuff. Like there, there's only so much real resolution you have, even if you virtually have this giant screen, like actually using it because you don't have that resolution gets a little tricky. I mean, I don't know. 1080p sounds great to me, but maybe that's because that's all I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, but like I think about it, I have a 65 inch 4K TV in my uh -huh. living room. But like if I'm at a working distance of that, that I would work at a laptop, I imagine I would, you know, like depending on how many things I was trying to have, if I'm trying to have up like four different windows, like the whole idea is you're replacing multi monitor setups with this. I, I feel like that would get to you after a while at mm -hmm. 1080 at a at a hundred with as, added in the boxed in effect you know with the field of view again this sounds like it's very early access like it's a wired connection to these third party uh you know ar glasses so who knows if this you know when this ships as a product if there's any uh advancement on that in, in terms mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff so right i i like the idea i i, I do like the idea of let's let's use this to to expand the work surface i just think I don't know if this is the thing as, as yeah. we've uh, we've been seeing from uh, Sightful right now. Well, I bet that many people in our audience think something or other about this exact idea. Do you want your next laptop to be VR? And that's what you do. If so, <laughs> email our thought your thoughts to us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. <laughs> All right, for over a century, movie theaters, inventors have all been toying with the idea of technology to release aromas, you know, things that you smell, aimed to specific sequences during a film so the audience could smell what was happening on screen. I mean, olfactory senses are a pretty big deal. The most famous was the smell-o-vision technology introduced in the 1960s movie Scent of a Mystery. Mm -hmm. Well... A team at the City University of Hong Kong have developed a lightweight, flexible, and wireless olfactory interface for use with VR experiences to deliver, hopefully precisely, smells such as lavender, pineapple, or green tea to users at appropriate times. So, you know, it, it, uh, it, 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 it. It, uh, it makes somebody feel something. So, Nikki, you've been following the story. Explain to us what they are doing. Yeah. So, to, like you said, smell-o-vision in the, in the 60s wasn't, I wouldn't know if we would call it tech. Um, <laughs> some of their solutions were putting a wad of cotton that was soaked in perfume and sticking it under the seat of the cinema or <laughs> pumping perfume into the ventilation system, which people said made them confused more than anything else. Um, overall, it was kind of a bust, but kind of remains in this sort of fixed-in-glass sci-fi ideas. Uh, personally, I have, I don't, since forever, always wanted to have some kind of a uh, smell recorder and emitter system. Like I've, I've always dreamed of this. This is why I put the story up here. But like every time I make fresh baked cookies, I want to text someone with the smell of the cookies. Why can't we do this? It doesn't seem that hard, right? But uh, so I'm a little bit skeptical about this because we haven't done it yet. But so what are these people doing? So I will explain. This week, uh, an article in Nature came out by engineer Shingo Yu and the colleagues at the University of Hong Kong, which developed this lightweight, flexible olfactory interface that should be delivering smells to VR users. Um, they cite being able to emit smells, like you said, lavender, but also things like durian, coconut Ooh, durian. milk, Ooh. pancake, and mojito. <laughs> so they went a little crazy with their smell testing there. <laughs> yeah. um, but basically how it works is that you've got like a, a thick silicone band-aid type thing under your nose and there's little paraffin wax pads in there that are heated they contain the odor and they're heated by an electrode to melt at certain te certain temperatures and then they'll release an odor straight into your nose mm -hmm. um it actually has two versions so it's got this sort of band-aid sized version and then it's got a, a bigger one that's more like a face mask so the band-aid one allows you to emit only two choices of odors and the bigger one has about nine and they say that you can combine all these odors separately into about 30 different smells. I don't know what happens when you combine durian and coconut milk, but I don't know if I want to know. Magic. Um, so, yeah. so, so Nikki, I mean, hearing all of this, I'm like, this is interesting. You know, uh -huh. I mean, sense of smell for many of us is like, ooh, 
that's how you remember a memory. Yes. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's how you were catapulted back to 10 years ago at a certain time where you were driving down the road, you know, it, like, so, so, so what is the goal? They have a, one of their main goals is selling it as VR. Uh, they do try to broaden it out and they say we could try and use this for applications that involve evoking emotions, like you said, uh, which is deeply connected to memory in the hippocampus in the brain. And I actually covered this in my last class, so I'm like all up to date on it right now. But uh, they're suggesting this as an aid for depression. Um, oh. For example, you know, trying to evoke positive memories to see if that would do anything. Mm. Uh, they also said that it could be a great tool for avoiding smelly environments. <laughs> so if you work at a sewage plant, maybe you could get one of these, stick it under your nose. Um, they also are trying to miniaturize the system and make it about 10 times smaller in future iterations because it is still, I think from the design right now, it looks really not really practical yeah, like imagine not a something you want to wear on your face on your maybe you have to yeah it, the face is, mask is okay but yeah what does the response time look like for this because i know like smell just doesn't like travel the same like you know light we can turn on a light and it's like immediately hitting our eye like what yeah like, how fast does that get around so they managed to make it quite fast because it's directly under their under your nose they say it's about a second and a half which is pretty good uh, considering until now, any applications like this have just been like really miniaturized perfume bottles that'll basically like spritz something into your nose, what? but this is actually melting and releasing odors. They didn't really clarify, but I imagine you would have to replace the paraffin eventually because it evaporates. Um, so looks like, again, this is kind of just like the AR uh, goggles in the sense that like, it seems cool. Maybe it'll go somewhere. I feel like I'd be down to test this, but I don't know if we're there yet. At, at CES, they had like uh, I think it was Toshiba had these very interactive uh, uh, like VR suits, right? Where it's Ooh. like every element, you know, you could have a chest thing and arm thing, so you could feel different, you know, to add that sense of touch. And I could see next year, you know, building on this tech and having having because they already have like this crazy mask and stuff like that, so you can you get uh, face capture and stuff like that too. So I could imagine them adding the smell of vision, but it's the therapeutic stuff. I think that really fascinates me because because you're absolutely yeah. right like that that sense of smell to to put you in a time and place like mm -hmm. i i yeah. i know i am there with with certain things where i'm like oh i'm back i'm back in the nicu this is like i'm about to cry now or yeah. something like that like, and nikki it, can, it happens real fast i had never besides nostalgia until you said like this could combat something like depression you know or you know other you know issues where you know PTSD. people are trying to kind of yeah get out of that this this makes a lot of sense. Um, it you know, makes as sense. I I'd be you gotta be careful with this kind of thing. So I'm interested to see where they go with this. But yeah, interesting. Well, speaking of going somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna love this one, Nikki. North Carolina-based yes. company Pairwise has edited the DNA of mustard greens, engineering them to be less bitter than the original plant. If you are familiar with mustard greens, you might like them raw. Many people say, eh, mm, no, 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 can't do that. So it's the first CRISPR edited food on the U.S. market. That's, that's notable. Pairwise says it hopes that consumers could start choosing something like these less pungent greens over less nutritious options like iceberg and butter lettuce. Not to throw all the other lettuce under yeah. the bus, really? but it turns out the mustard <laughs> greens just have a lot more vitamins in them. So, you know, the pair wise is saying you should eat more of it. If you don't like it, we're going to help you. The greens will initially be in select restaurants and outlets in the Minneapolis, St. Paul region, St. Louis, Springfield, Massachusetts, Pairwise says it plans to bring them to grocery stores this summer. Didn't have a lot of details on that, but said likely in the Pacific Northwest. Always a good place for the vegan sort of things. <laughs> now, Pairwise also says after tackling mustard greens, they would like to improve fruits, creating seedless blackberries, pitless cherries, for example. How do we feel about this? I. I like this because people freak out about this kind of thing when this is just accelerated natural selection. Like you could have bred this out of mustard greens. Part of me is like, if you don't like mustard greens, don't eat mustard greens, but right. <laughs> apparently they're yeah. more nutrition. Um, so, you know, you have, you have it in here, like 
just so you know, these aren't GMOs, genetically modified organisms. That is made by adding genetic material from a different organism into this material, into this organism. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And that, you just, know, people get a little weirded out about that sometimes. Yeah, which they don't really have to. I think the only danger that this would have is if they're planting this somewhere and the seeds escape and cross pollinate with other seeds of mustard greens, you might get some not spicy enough mustard greens. Uh, but it's not going to go in and crisper your skeleton or whatever. So don't worry about that part. Now, Rich, I don't know how you feel about mustard greens or salad in general. I mean, I'm a salad fan. I'll eat all salad. I love mustard I, greens. I, uh, me too. You know, when they the, they use the example of like, maybe it could, you know, you know, take the place of iceberg lettuce. I'm like, iceberg lettuce has no taste at all. Ugh. Yeah. But pairwise, do not come for my butter lettuce. Okay, we are going to have a butter fight. Butter lettuce is fire. T- take your yeah. take your iceberg. That's fine. We're we're good. We have peace there. But don't come for my butter lettuce. But I mean, or if I- you're if you're someone who says like, I love iceberg lettuce, yeah. don't. T- that yeah. that's not what this is about. This but, is about making people who you know maybe yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, let's use the you know term more broccoli. accessible lettuce. Yeah, yeah like <laughs> if more accessible lettuce. Hey, exactly, accessibility I, I, I lettuce. Say, like if they could, you know, uh, uh, I'm thinking like kale for example. You know, characteristically very bitter or something like that. If they could do something like that, and you could, you know, it makes it easier for for some people to enjoy it. That's great. Where they need to go though, cilantro. Okay, for the people, the non cilantro oh, people, rich. if they can, if they can breed, you know, make We're a gonna breed get emails this, about this one. they can crisper the cilantro to make it non soapy for the soapy cilantro people. Are you a I soapy the, cilantro person? I am not. I love the cilantro. I will okay. just eat a sprig of it. Like, but right people now, do. With yeah. my butter lettuce. Yeah. My butter <laughs> lettuce. That, you know burrito. what? That That is a great use for this. That's what I'm make saying. Make cilantro not taste like soap. There we go. And make everybody have a better taco taste. I'm surprised they didn't start with that, honestly. Cilantro piece, pairwise. Yeah, no, We're counting no, on you. No crap. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Okay, so this one comes from Jeremy talking about companies uh, who are trying to put VR in cars. Not the car companies themselves, but we spoke with Allison Sheridan yesterday about uh, Meta specifically saying, yeah, yeah, people want that. Jeremy says, autonomous customers have to do something when they're in cars and they're not driving and potentially even data could be sold through the 5g or 6g connections besides data collection funny how you talked about this the same show as the tesla autopilot yeah well jeremy we didn't put the two and two together um we we didn't not do it uh but but yeah, at first I was like, no, no, somebody still has to be, you know, operating the vehicle. But if you are talking true autonomous, you're sitting in the back seat, even if you're sitting in the passenger seat, maybe that does give somebody something else to do. Sure. Why? Why not? Uh, more options, the merrier, as long as there's no motion. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Michael sent an email and he's been wanting a way to hail an Uber with a phone call. He writes in, he says, I'm not completely blind, but pretty close. There are several incidents when I'm outside and the, you know, sun's not being my friend. I'm trying to order a ride, having a number and then say, you know, hey, Siri, call Uber. And hopefully the call can just operate like, hi, Michael, are you at address blank and want to be picked up? And you could say, you know, give some direction, you know, give some more specificity and then get a direction that, hey, John and a red Honda Civic will arrive in five minutes. So that would be uh, Michael's ideal interaction with that kind of a system. And Michael's also hopes he can uh, record more info uh, uh, <laughs> uh, at the same for time. For the driver. So, yeah, yeah, for the driver saying, I'm visually impaired wearing an orange baseball cap, green jacket, you know, giving some more information and some context. Please uh, come to me instead of me trying to find you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I, I I love this idea to uh, to make that happen. Uh, you know, that would be a real big boon for uh, people with uh, a visual and a whole bunch of disabilities. So me too, Michael. I'm glad you wrote in point. when Tom and Allison and I were you know kicking this around yesterday. We were like, this will obviously be good for a lot of people, but yeah, this is a, a really it. good use case of Michael being like, this would help me so much. Instead of having to like navigate an app, you know, whether he's in the sunshine or not, and you know, and just, you know, at having other options is good for accessibility. Absolutely. 
Well, Dr. Nikki Ackermans, you are great for our accessibility because you tell us all the nice things every time that you're on the show. You always bring the knowledge. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yes, ma'am. They can find me at NicoleAckermans.com. Pretty simple. And I'm pretty active on Twitter these days still at Ackermans Nicole. So that's it. Very cool. Well, we're glad to have you today. Come back I'm early glad to be and here. often. <laughs> also want to special thank our brand new boss named Alex. Alex just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Alex. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Alex. And if money's a little tight right now, believe me, we get it. Consider joining our Patreon for free. Just scroll down past the paid options at patreon.com slash DTNS. You'll get monthly updates, things like Roger's column and the Friday GDI. So you can keep up on all the fun. Indeed. Uh, speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show. Good day, internet, where we're going to be talking about the beep berry. That's a messaging gadget that uses an old BlackBerry keyboard. What could go wrong? <laughs> but uh, just a reminder, you can catch the show mo uh, live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewshow.com slash live. And just a reminder, you know, like I said, we do it every day. Tomorrow we'll be back with Rob Dunwood and Len Peralta joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>